part of this uh, uh, B-Mensual uh, trade testing uh, virtually on Zoom. I really appreciate the support and everybody is part of this meeting. I really do appreciate the support and to be part of this uh, beautiful testing that we're going to introduce you uh, in a minute. My dear friend, Andre de Vigneault. I don't know if Ali, his second half is next to him, but uh, we are going to introduce Andre. We're going to talk about Mendocino. We're going to talk about Anderson Valley. We're going to talk about Pinot Noir. Uh, very proud to be the distributor. We are very proud to be distributor in California and Nevada for this beautiful project up north. Um, I think it's the last thing that we can discover from, uh, from Andre, his vision. Uh, how did he make wine and uh, where, did, where the project starts and uh, all the good stuff. You're welcome to ask any question at any time. Um, I'm just asking you to wave your hand. I know it's kind of the classroom, but it's just to create a good vibe on the, on the presentation. I want to thank you everyone. So for the people that don't know me, I'm Bruno Laclotte. I'm the owner of Regency Wine Nevada, establishing in uh, Las Vegas for the past 17 years. We also have our team from Reno that we opened about two years and a half ago. Uh, with Smitty, my GM. Uh, Alan, uh, obviously, uh, most of you know him. He's from Vegas. He's my... GM in Vegas for all this time. And uh, obviously, Hillside Wine and Spirit here in California, where we're a distributor for the past 25 years now. So I want to thank you, everyone, to, uh, to be part of this and just have fun. Just to bring over your glass of wine. Let's share the passion together. And there we go. Thank you, Andre, to be here uh, this morning. I really appreciate the support. I really, uh, you know how much I love your wine and uh, how uh, happy we are to uh, represent your product in the market. Obviously, you don't just do Pinot Noir, but Pinot Noir is your forte. That's why you uh, do the most. So uh, thank you again, Andre. Thank you very much. Here we go. That's your turn, buddy. All right. Thanks, Bruno. Uh, thanks for having me on here. Uh, Lisa will be joining us in just a moment, but I'll, I'll introduce the brand, Bee Hunter is from Anderson Valley. I was born and raised in Anderson Valley in, uh, in Mendocino County. And uh, we've been making wine there since 2013. Um, Anderson Valley is justifiably famous for Pinot Noir. So of course our, our bread and butter is Pinot Noir and we have many single vineyards and we have a, uh, an Anderson Valley blend. Uh, but we make all sorts of wines. We, uh, we make Grenache and Syrah, Carignan, Cab Merlot, uh, Sauvignon Blanc, Semillon, Riesling. Uh, we just keep making all the different kinds of wines. But um, our big, our big megaphone is is Pinot Noir. It's um, it's we have access to some of the best vineyards, and um, people people pay attention when they see Anderson Valley Pinot Noir. So we're gonna have um, be tasting Pinot Noir today. Yes, yeah, um, so our two Pinot Noir. So we're going to have the uh, B Enter Anderson Valley 2016 and the uh, single vineyard Docker Hills and everybody has a buzz on the front of them and the glass. It looks like some few people already start testing one, which is a great thing. Uh, before we get to the wine, uh, Andre, I want to ask you a few questions about your background and uh, the story of your family because I know uh, at the first time when I was talking to you, I thought that you were French for a sec, which it looks like you do have some French blood. <laughs> But uh, yeah, Andre de Vigneault. So that's why I call you Andy, because you obviously don't speak French yet. So Not yet. We're, we're, we're working on it. And we're working on it. So tell us okay. a little bit more about your, uh, your family, your background, and uh, where you established, and uh, when they, how did you start this program? So if you go all the way back to France, I do have French, French ancestors. Um, they were Huguenots, uh, French uh, Protestants that were thrown out of France in the 1400s. So they meandered over to uh, Holland and were uh, Dutch colonists, uh, part of the first first uh, Dutch colonist in New Amsterdam, which is now New York. And they um, bounced around, ended up, oh, look at that. Oh, yes. Unfined, unfiltered. Or as I like to say, it's unfiltered and that's fine. <laughs> um so uh, my family's been here in the New World for a long time. Um, my, my father's an engineer. Uh, he moved us uh, from San Diego up to Anderson Valley. I was born in Anderson Valley. And um, out of college, I decided to never get a job. So I started working at a winery, Navarro Vineyards. And uh, it turned out to be the best education I ever had. Um, I learned how to make wine. Uh, I learned how to taste wine, most importantly. And um, 
Navarro is a, a, a cuvee house. It's all about blending. So um, we tasted wine for an hour and a half, 9.30 to 11 o'clock, five days a week, nine months of the year, everything except harvest and bottling uh, season. And it really, really focused my palate and um, I'm blessed with a good palate, but uh, there's nothing like practicing, tasting, tasting, tasting. So the way, the way we make wine is we taste the grapes, or we taste the wine. Um, so that by necessity means that all of the vineyards are close to us. Uh, I have to drive out there. We go out and we taste the grapes. We walk around uh, the wineries just down the hill from our house. Um, so it's a very hands-on approach. Um, oh, look, here's Elisa. It's my wife, Elisa. Hi. Hello, Elisa. <laughs> thank you to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you. So this is the second half. Thanks, Hadi is here sometime to give direction or <laughs> to, to stop to stop Andre to make more and more wine. <laughs> but uh, she's doing a great job. Thank you to be here. Thank I you. I always be you. hunting. Always be hunting. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so, so these maybe, uh, maybe because Hadi, sorry, maybe because Hadi just show up. Maybe uh, the the good transition here should be how did you meet each other and how. Uh, be enter start. Mm. Go ahead. Uh, thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, Bruno, for having us here. And um, we hope when it's possible that we can chat in person, but it's kind of fun to be able to do this from anywhere. So um, one of the uh, ways that we met is because we love dinner. Andy's parents were the um, caterers for Navarro Vineyards for a decade. And Andy makes really good food and likes to eat really well. And I like to crash dinner parties. So he was at a uh, dinner and there's an empty seat next to him and the rest is all bottled up in wine on your table. So you met through the wine and through the food. For well, most of us, it's the same story, but that's great to hear that. So who did have the idea about the name of Bee Hunter and what exactly, uh, how Bee Hunter was born? You're going straight for the kill, I love it. No. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, Andy's palette is um, by far just one of the most superior palettes I've ever uh, been able to be close to. And so I was just very cheeky and I was reading a book called the Bootling Book. And um, in Boonville, there's a language called Bootling. It was spoken in the 1800s. And uh, there's words like to have a ball is to have a good time. To drink is to horn, so ball horning is good drinking, and bee hunter is bootling. So um, we are hippies of the Shire. We have bees, we have honey, we believe in sourcing from organically grown and sustainable vineyards. But um, the truth of the matter, since you asked so nicely, I'll tell you, is that bees have nothing to do, or bee hunter has nothing to do with bees or hunting. So uh, a bee hunter is verbatim from the bootling book dictionary a valley girl who when she was out and about doing whatever she pleased and somebody asked where were you what were you doing what are you up to she would reply evasively that she'd been bee hunting so that's where i was for the first half of this call <laughs> nice. well done well done that sounds great um so when uh, how did you uh, manage uh, andy what is your philosophy when you're buying grapes so let's put it this way you obviously do have direct and a great relationship with the grower up north, and especially in Anderson Valley. Um, so how do you manage, how do you build those relationships, and what exactly are you looking for when you buy those grapes? Well, so, you know, I've known many of these growers for, for 25 years or longer, and so I've, I've known them since before I was making wine in many cases. Uh, so it starts out with personal relationships. And, and, and to this day, I think we only, we may only have one of our growers that has an actual contract. This is all based on, on a handshake, on, on, on- I know meeting. where you live. I know where you live. I know who you are. Uh, <laughs> let's do this collaboratively. So. Uh, I look at the, the grape growing as a collaborative process and um, it, at Lichen, where we have our, our winery, um, O2, and, um, and our, our, we're literally part of the growing process so that we can have our estate um, label starting in, with the 2018 vintage. But, but it, for all the growers, we're out there walking uh, the vines, talking to the growers. You know, there's still some growers that use conventional um, 
products on their on their vines and we're working really hard to to get them to go biodynamic and organic and and we've done a really good job we went from from less than half of our growers being being certified to nearly all of them now um there's some some uh, tough walnuts to crack out there uh you know how old farmers can be but um it really is about is about a, a conversation uh, we just saw a question come up about dry farming, and I want to address yeah. that. But also what's interesting is that in our valley, water is an issue um, in California all over. But we definitely um, will speak to that dry farming. Uh, we also have something called um, socials. Uh, not so much anymore, but uh, it's when everybody in the valley that makes wine or grows wine brings a bottle to a monthly social event where we all taste and talk and meet. And so because of our um, motto that we're always hunting, they know that we're open to then taking what they have and sharing it with all y'all um, and that their vineyard and their practices will be more widespread as a result of working with us through, through you know, Bruno and uh, the people that you bring our wines to. So that's important for our little valley nestled in the hills of Mendocino to entrust their grapes with us. And that's also part of it. So it's longstanding family relationships and also people that we meet that are like, we love what you're doing. We want to have you represent us. So do um, you want to speak to Dry for me? Uh, I, di I didn't see the question, but... Um... Like Mariah, for example. Yeah, um, uh, Mariah's dry farmed. Mariah um, will be your Chardonnay, correct? Chardonnay and um, a Pinot's coming out. We have a Pinot coming out 2019. We did Mariah Pinot Noir. The Sauvignon Blanc sold out. Uh, we sold out a Sauvignon Blanc. Um, we have another so Mariah. What you oh, think, what you, Andy, uh, a little bit more. Uh, we all have an idea about what dry farming does, especially for you know the people in Europe where we don't have no other choice than actually work with dry farming vineyards. But in your sense, uh, what's dry farming uh, bring over to the glass? Well, so it it's it it brings a density, a texture, um, a depth to the wine um, because the roots are so much deeper. They really have to be. We in France, uh, it rains in the summertime, and so some vineyards get get enough rain that the the roots are are deep. Um, others are shallow. But in California, we don't. There's no rain. June, all the way into harvest, there's going to be no rain. So it really forces the grapes roots to push down deeper into the soil. And so this, this minerality, this, this fine grain um, texture that, that, that we strive for uh, is just so much more latent in the dry farmed vineyards. Um, I think everybody will agree California, with that for sure. We, we, they have to water the grapes to start. Um, so year one through four or five, uh, all the grapes need water because they just the roots aren't down there yet. If you if you look out in California uh, in the summertime, everything's brown except for the trees, and the trees have the roots that go all the way down into the subsoil. The grasses, all the annuals have have gone completely brown by the middle of June. Um, same with the grapes. So um, a good a good grower starts off with lots of small waterings the first year, and then tapers them off with deeper waterings, and those roots will follow that water. Um, obviously they can't go quickly, but they will follow it. And by year five, those roots are all the way down and um, you can turn off the water. And, um... Got it. And um, uh, the relationship you have, you, you said and you, you managed to, with your relationship to, uh, to, uh, to give direction to people to go uh, biodynamic, to go organic or dry farming. Do you give any incentive to those people? Do you pay more for your grape? I mean, what is the way do you, or do you just putting a gun on their hand and say, if you don't do that, you will not buy your wine or, or, or I mean, your grape? But what is your technique here? So yes, there is, you know, we have um, the county publishes um, prices for for all of the the book rates for the grapes, um, which is what we base most of our pricing off of. And and there is a premium for organic, and there is a premium for sustainable. But you know, some vineyards, you know, each each contract is negotiated, and and some some growers feel that they don't want to go organic, and that their their fruit is already the highest level. It's a premium standard. Um, and I think that you know a lot of the big Napa growers. Are not organic. Um, Cabernet does much better with no weeds, uh, and they don't want to pay for for hand hand cultivation in terms of weeding. Um, so you know each each thing we have with the farmer is different. Um, 
But yeah, we certainly are willing to pay a premium uh, for organically grown grapes. Uh, right. And that's, 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 that's only fair because it, it, it costs more to grow organically. I, I, I do agree with that. And I, it's great that you have those relationships. Now, let's, uh, let's say about what do you that think? Real quick too? Sure, go ahead. Go ahead. That, um, that it has to do a lot with you guys. You know, if the push comes from the market as well, that we're able to, um, you know, use all of the talking points to move more of the wine and then buy more of the grapes, then regardless if, you know, what the price is at all, we're going to choose to purchase from certain vineyards that we're able to sell. And so if the, the market and the consumer is pushing that agenda, then we can take that to the farmer as well and say, we want to do this so that we can continue to have that be our theme. So it's kind of a, a full circle. Okay, great. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, let's move to, uh, obviously, we talk about the vineyard, we talk about dry farming organically. So now we have a better idea about where those grapes come from and the, your technique to uh, purchase those grapes. Can you uh, now, we're going to move to testing because we need to keep uh, the meeting going because few people need to go back on the, on the field and go back on the, on, on the floor for some of you uh, um, did manage to reopen your restaurant hotels. But uh, uh, let's let's uh, let everybody please grab a glass of wine if you didn't do that yet. I'm pretty sure everybody has it and uh, grab the, the Pinot Noir, the Pinot Noir 2016 Anderson Valley. And uh, Andy, as everybody's testing the Pinot Noir right now, the first one, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about uh, vinification? But before we do that, Jeffrey has a question. So let's uh, let's have Jeffrey. It's have just a statement that. actually because ours are 15 vintage across the board. I don't have any 16. Yeah, both 15s. So, anyway. Okay. So, do you want us to uh, clarify the difference between the 16 and the 15? If some people are tasting 15, then sure. Yes, yes. Uh, so, Andy, uh, uh, let's make this a 15 and 16. Um, it looks like few people do have the 15. So, I believe the people from Vegas did get the 15, it looks like. Uh, so, can you give us the difference between the 15 and the 16 in your sense? So just for, for the people that don't have the 16 on the front of them can, can see the difference, if there's any. Yes, of course. So uh, 2015 was, um, was a year that had lots of, um, lots of small berries. Uh, one seed berries that were you know, about half the size, zero seed berries that are tiny. Um, and because of that, uh, it was very low yielding and uh, it ripened quite quickly. So um, the expression of the, of the Anderson Valley Pinot Noir was more of the red fruit. So we have more of the red cherry, um, dusty rose, spicy. Um, 2016 was a more of a normal vintage in terms of uh, nice small clusters, but even larger berries. More classic. Uh, and it took a lot longer to ripen it. And so the, the tannin structure on the 16 is, um, is bigger, it's a little bit richer, uh, and the flavor, the fruit flavors uh, tend a little bit more towards um, towards the black fruit. So we get uh, satsuma plum and a um, little, bit, little bit richer and riper. Um, but it's Anderson Valley, so when I, when I say richer and riper, I'm not talking about Russian River or, or, or anything like that. It's, it's, um, it really is just a, um, just a little bit difference uh, of, of the vintage, so. Um, the 15 is, is tasting oh, oh, really nice right now. I have a question from Jeffrey. Jeffrey, go ahead. Well, I just wonder about rain in 2016 versus 15. Did you have the problems that Napa did at harvest uh, with rain? So Pinot Noir ripens well before Cab, and so we didn't have any problems with our Pinot and rain. The rain came after uh, 2015. There was no problem at all. We had a really early vintage uh, because of the small, small yield. Um, and in 2016, the rains came after after all of our Pinot Noir was harvest, harvested. We had um, our Grenache sat through a rain, uh, but it's got tough skin, so it's it's fine through the rain. Um, our Zin was harvested before all of our whites except for Riesling. Um, Sauvignon Blanc was off, Chardonnay was off. So yeah, we were we were we were okay in 2016. Good. Did I answer your question, Jeffrey? Good. Um, let's talk about vinification. Uh, can you uh, give us pretty much your vision, your philosophy, and what exactly you're trying to accomplish through vinification? What is your technique, if you may share that with us? 
Okay, so uh, we bring the grapes in. They're all hand-picked uh, in, in half-ton bins. Um, so there's not a, lot of, not a lot of juicing, not a lot of um, oxidation. Uh, and we go through a um, destemmer, pulls the stems off. And so no um, old cluster, none. We, we, we do a, let's see, in 20, 2015, because of the small, small um, berries, we did about 10% whole cluster. In 2016, we were at about 25% whole cluster. Um, 20, 2015, I was trying to minimize the, 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 the tannin. I didn't want to overload the tannin. So I did less, uh, less whole cluster. 2016, um, with the larger berries, I, f I felt like the uh, larger berries plus ripe stems is a great opportunity to include the, the whole cluster. So we, what we'll do is we'll put the, the whole cluster um, uh, directly on the bottom of the, of the uh, one ton bins we ferment in. These were fermented in one ton oak ovals, or not ovals, round with an open top. Um, we put the whole clusters, in this case for the 16, 25% on the bottom, and then we destem uh, over a sorting table and put the, 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 the whole berries on top with just a minimum amount of juicing. Um, we'll let it sit there for, you know, ideally the grapes come in nice and cold and we can get a, get a five or six days um, and they'll start f um, fermenting on their own. We don't add any, any yeast to it. Uh, we don't add any sulfur at the crusher. So whatever's, whatever's on the grape starts the fermentation and then the, um, the endemic yeast that's in the winery is what, what finishes it. So natural yeast, correct? You don't know? That, that's right. No, we don't, we don't add a uh, starter for primary or for secondary. Got it, got it. And then the process obviously, and then uh, as far as aging, what, what you do as far as aging? So quick question um, to all y'all out there. Would um, would you like to see you know the process as we're doing it? How how much do these videos? We have a YouTube channel. Would you like us to let you know when we when we are doing it to show you? Sometimes I just love you know just for fun capturing the moment. Does that matter to you and and your people? And and what what involvement would you like to have as it's happening so that you can remember like the 2020 vintage? Are we going to answer for my for, for everyone? I think yes. Okay. Every okay. every video, then you can do during vinification and fermentation. It's always for the trade. Always, you know, we were far away from the vineyard. For I'm going to talk about myself. I miss making wine, um, and every time I can put my head to it and I can watch someone doing it, I feel that I'm part of it. So I will be the yes. place for you to stay. If you want to come on up? <laughs> I, I I thank you for the invitation. I will definitely. Take that in consideration for sure. Okay, uh, so yeah, there's it a looks like we're not going to be so busy in August, so uh, maybe oh. that, will be, that will be the time for me to go back to August, I guess. All right, I'll make sure you have all of our details for the YouTube Bee Hunter Wine and the um, Instagram and everything like that, because I'll be posting and, and people can follow along, because it's a fun journey. And um, as high class as these wines are, we're also very approachable, and it's, it's a nice way to kind of combine the consumer with the vineyard. Nice, great. So yeah, I think it's always a plus. Uh, before we go back to more details, I want to give uh, everybody the opportunity to uh, give us their feedback on the wine they are testing. So if someone want to take the leads about their description on the wine, I'd be more than happy to uh, to give you the, the hands up. And uh, yeah, is anybody is up to the task right now? It looks like Karen. Karen, Karen is from uh, Reno. She on Vino 100 in Reno, and she's a huge supporter of our portfolio. Thank you, Karen, to be here. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, allergies. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I got to tell a really quick story about our first time to be hunter. Uh, we're with Gary and Dave Preston. Dave Preston is the gentleman I do the radio show with. And um, we went into the vineyard because, uh, or into their tasting room because it was recommended by another winery. And she said, oh my gosh, you don't miss this one. It's so great. So we immediately got in the car and we headed down there. So we were tasting with Allie and then she buzzed out and went and did something. And then <laughs> Andy was pouring for us. And um, in the very end, we were said, gosh, you know, maybe we'll try the Riesling. And so he pulls this bottle of Riesling out of the fridge, and mind you, it's Bee Hunter Riesling. 
And so late harvest, uh, late harvest uh, Riesling, correct? No, it was just their regular Riesling. Oh, wow. Yep. And he pulls it out of the fridge, and there literally is a bee on the label. <laughs> now we're like the bee killer. A real and actual bee. Oh, so actual he's suspended. wandering around the label, and he's putting his like foot on the glass, and as soon as he feels the glass, he realizes he can't walk on the glass, and the glass is terribly cold. Anyway, the net of the story is amazing to have a bee on the bee hunter wine <laughs> at bee hunter tree. Mother nature. Mother nature so, can be something sometimes. It was amazing. And so I walked out with the bottle and I put, they have a little um, flower thing outside and I put the bee uh, on a flower and he was a little stunned from being super cold, but um, he, he was successfully planted back in the garden. <laughs> right, thank you to show <laughs> with us. Appreciate that, Karen. This Anderson Valley unfiltered, unfined uh, Pinot, I have the 15 in front of me, and I'm getting really beautiful raspberry and a little, a little tiny bit of like tart cherry. It's super bright. You get this kind of really cool blood orange thing happening in it. And it is just, the texture's really, really nice. It begs for another sip. Um, I just love it. I think it's wonderful. And the acid is just perfectly balanced with the tannins. It's drinking so beautiful. Thank you, Karen, for the 2016. Who's up to the task for 2016? If you have 16, oh, sorry, Karen. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, I mute you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I just, I have the 15, so. Yeah, yeah so yeah. you did the description for the 15. Can somebody is up to the task for the 16? If you do have 16 on the front of you, are you up to the task? Anyone? Anyone, anyone, anyone? Anyone? Maybe Rick. Rick, buddy, I know you, you're pretty, you're pretty <laughs> tired up there. Sorry to put you around the corner, but you're on my screen around the corner, so. <laughs> Can you uh, give me uh, the sense? So, Rick, if nobody knows about Rick, he's my dear friend Rick from Los Angeles. Uh, Rick used to be at Auburn, and now you are, where are you right now? The new place that you just uh, be part of? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm lucky enough to be uh, opening my own project here. Uh, so, it's, uh, it's, it's coming along. So. Go Phillies. Yeah, nice. go Phillies. Go Phillies. Nice, good. So, uh, you have the 16 on the front of your Rick, right? Yes. Uh, so, I have the 16 here. Just look at this beautiful color, this kind of, uh, you know, this, this really kind of great scarlet kind of crimson color here, really pretty. And on the nose, get a lot of that really kind of brambly strawberry thing going on with almost like uh, this, this, this herbaceousness that kind of is, is really present there too. It's almost like a green herb component that's really, really cool. Uh, it, you know, to me it smells like rosemary and mint and Got some greeners in there as well, along with the strawberry component. That's really, really delicious on the palate. Beautiful. Just confirming that strawberry fruit, a little bit of that kind of uh, that Bing cherry thing happening there as well. Beautiful acidity on that kind of crunchy fruit. The, the fruit's very, very fresh, and vibrant. Uh, for 16, this is really, really alive. Um, great finish on this. This is awesome. Thank you, Eric. I really appreciate that. I, I love your description always. Uh, thank you and congratulations on the new uh, position at this uh, new place. I really appreciate that. Thanks, man. Um, uh, I grew up outside of Philly, so I used to go to the games. I love that you're presenting that. That's great. Oh, amazing. Yeah, I'm from New Jersey myself, like South Jersey, like the Burlington County area. But uh, I, I, I mean, I'm a lifelong fan of the Philadelphia Phillies and will always support them no matter what. <laughs> Yeah, my mom married a rabbi, so we'd always go to Cherry Hill and just drive over from... Cherry, Cherry Hill's right next door to where I grew up. I'm, I'm from Medford, yep. so, yeah. Got you. Yeah, enjoy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very well. Um, let's now talk about, uh, we obviously mm -hmm. get, so where these uh, grabs come from on the, on, the, on the Anderson Valley, on the 15, on the 16? Is there any difference where you purchase the fruit from on the 15, on the 16, or it's something you, you always use for this cuvee? Uh, we use the same vineyards, but it's different ratios. And so the 2015 has more valley fruit. And uh, I would say when I, when there's west, west facing, east facing, cool end of the valley, hot end of the valley, 
but really probably more important is how much wind the vineyard gets. Um, the 2015, the, there's a higher proportion of vineyards that get a little bit less wind. Less wind ripens a little bit faster, um, but, but skews more towards the, the red fruit, a little bit, um, little bit uh, softer. The windier, the windier locations uh, skew a little bit more from that like red cherry to black cherry. And you get a little bit even more of that tomato vine, that kind of red with that, that, that herbaceousness. Uh, just that, um, you know, that's, for me, that's the classic giveaway for Anderson Valley is that, that tomato vine. And it's not the smell, it's not the taste of a tomato. It's the smell when you pick a tomato and your hand touches the green vine. And when you smell it, it has that, it's, it's, it's a very distinct smell. And then you and take a bite of that still sun warm, ripe red tomato and that's, that, that crunchy red fruit with a little bit of green. Um, so the, the windy, the windier aspects. Um, and so I think 60% was from windy in 2016. So um, that, that can be in the valley floor on the top of a hill, but generally it's on the, on the sides of the valley where the, where the wind is, there's more wind. And so there's a higher percentage. There's almost 60% uh, fash hour, which is up, up on the ridge uh, and gets nice wind. So that's, that's the, that's the uh, the difference on on structure, I think, in that, um, as well, of course, the, the the ripening times and the and the, the uniformity of, of uh, uniform grape size gives you a little bit more density of that mid palate tannin on the sixteen. Very well. And incidentally, if you ever try to give Andy a tomato, make sure it's not a conventional tomato out of season yeah. because he where we live, we have such delicious tomatoes that he just refuses. He'll he'll pick it off anything. What else do you grow in this uh, property up there? Oh, we grow tomatoes. We uh, we grow a bunch of cannabis. Lots of herbs. Lots of herbs, uh, which also does well out of the wind. So so our location is on the on the backside. So the wind goes over the top. We hear the wind in the redwood trees, but it'll be perfectly still at our farm. What is the uh, difference to grow uh, vine and to grow tomatoes and to grow marijuana? Well, vines <laughs> vines take many years, and the um, the terroir more, is literally the soil that it's growing in as the roots grow deeper and deeper and pull more flavors out of the soil, in addition to the weather and the aspect. Um, but cannabis and, and, and tomatoes are, are annuals, and so um, really climate is much more important, like the wind at the site. The soil that it's grown in, you know, most people are, are growing uh, tomatoes in, in potting soil and they're growing cannabis in, in amended soil. No one's, you know, if you tried to put cannabis out in, in the rocky soil that we grow the grapes in, you know, they would get six inches tall and they might be delicious, but um, it, it would, wouldn't be commercially viable. And, and it, it's if you tried to harvest grapes the first year from putting little vines in, you wouldn't get any grapes. It's not to your five where you start getting nice clusters and you're 10 when you have like a full size harvest and it really begins to express the terroir you know that first year you make it into rosé or sell it off to someone because it doesn't have that that density that 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 real vine pulling the moisture and the mineral out out of the soil it what takes, year it takes the time. Docker hill Docker hill 14 how many years have it been planted <laughs> So we are going now to uh, talk about the 14. So that's the second one. Okay. So Docker Hill, we're going to obviously talk a little bit more about this specific site and this specific vineyard. Is anybody, before we get to that, has everybody has any other question on the 16, on the 15, on the Sun Valley? We're not going to talk about prices now, you know that. We're going to talk about those special deals that we have at the end of the session. So if you're patient enough, I'm going to keep it to one hour. I know everybody's busy. But in the last five minutes of the hour, I will announce the special deals that will be in place for the next uh, 10 days or until you reopen your place, guys. So uh, as anybody has a question on that, uh, on the 16, on the 15, Anderson Valley, did we cover everything that you want to ask for? I will take that as a yes. So we are now going to move towards the second one, which is the uh, Docker Hills. 2014, I believe everybody has the same wine this time. No? You have the one? 15. I'm sorry. See, that's the way you were. When you're a distributor in two states sometimes, you have like a lack of consistency in vintages, but because it's vintages, so 
I try to grab as much one as I can from B Hunter, but it looks like we're going pretty fast uh, in some of the, it looks like Docker Hills then sold better in Nevada and the entry level Anderson Valley sold better in California, but every market is different, you know that. And that's why I believe those Zoom meetings are great because we can exchange what sell the most, we can exchange what is our demography and what the people are looking for. So I'm sorry then we have different vintages, but we have the winemaker here and he can tell us the difference between the 14 and the 15. So Docker Hills, uh, Andy, give us a sense about where Docker Hills is, why Docker Hills Vineyard is so important and so interested to work with. So Docker Hill is 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 out of Appalachian. It's it's in Comfrey. Comfrey is just like Anderson Valley, but more so. It's it's a little foggier. It's a little bit more extreme. It's a little little bit taller redwood trees. Uh, it just happens to be one little valley, one folded valley north of Anderson. So um, this is on top of a um, on top of a hill. Uh, it's it's there's a little valley called Surprise Valley. Uh, Oppenlanders Landers on the bottom and then a Docker Hills up on top. So we get we get both of those and it's a nice juxtaposition because you can see the vineyard one from the other. It's really just about uh, elevation and soil. And um, it's, a, it's a fairly small vineyard. Um, modern plantings uh, down below in Oppenlander, they're big tractor rows. Up on top there are five and a half foot by three foot. So nice tight spacing. It's not quite meter by meter but it's about as tight as you can get uh, without going meter by meter, and, and it, uh, it it expresses it. There's a there's a density of of tannin, density of flavor in the in the Docker Hill that just is is. How many clones? Uh, it's five clones: Pomard, Swan, Upright Eight Two Eight, One Fifteen, Seven Seven Seven. Uh, so it's a nice blend. Dry farming uh, or not? Uh, so in twenty fourteen. That was the fifth year of, it was planted. So it was a five-year-old vineyard in 2014. So they still were irrigating. By 2015, they had, they had uh, tapered off. So um, it is a difference between the 14 and the 15, you think, in test? I, I'm not, I think, honestly, the, the, the difference between the 14 and 15 has more to do with the, the size of the berries in 2015. Uh, same reason and same reason than the other Pinot. Yeah, and really the dry farming, you know, all of the all of the vineyards up here that are irrigating are doing the very minimal amount of irrigating. They're not irrigating to increase crop level. They're just trying to get the grapes right before they start to raise and keep the leaves healthy. Um, everyone's using pressure bombs to make sure that the vines really are in that in that. So so dry farming is is really more about getting the roots deep. If you were to put a water on a, on, on a vine that had been dry farmed for 10 years, in the middle of the summer gave it water and then stopped, I don't think it would change the wine that year. But I think year after year, the continued dry farming does make those roots go deeper and deeper and deeper. So I'm not so sure that the dry farming difference between 14 and 15 is, is terribly relevant. I really think that the, the, the cool wet spring we had in 2015 was just, um, low yield because a lot of the a lot of the um the flowers didn't didn't get pollinated and so we had uh, a lot of a lot of uh berries tiny tiny berries with no seed and a high ratio of skin to juice and so that that really that that the tannin you get from the skin is, is so different than the seed or the stem uh it really has this this plush soft mid palate tannin that um that, uh, you know, when you taste it, if you were to kind of get past the flavors, it, it has the tannin density of like a Merlot or, or a, something that has more of that, 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 um, that mid-palate tannin. Uh, but that's just because of the small berry size. Do you do any difference in vinification when you pick it up the grape from different sites, like the Docker Hills? Do you change any, your, any, any technique in vinification or you try to yeah. do the same so formula? The, the tools we have, because we're not, we're not, you know, some, some wineries use different yeast based on the different grapes. We're just using whatever happens to be in the winery. So the tools we have are how much whole cluster. And uh, that literally is me chewing on the stems as the, as the grapes come into the winery and, and assessing how ripe the tannins in the, in the stems are. Because the tannins go from very green and harsh to sort of hardened off and unavailable. But there's this mid-range mid where it's still crunchy 
but it has this dark tannin in without any of the green sharpness that it's that it's really good for. So I always make that whole cluster decision when the grapes are coming in, you know, taste taste through the stems, taste through the berries. Um, and then later, how much uh, oak we put on it. Uh, 2014 has really nice, nice tannin. We actually, I actually use zero new oak on that. So there's, there's some one-year-old oak on that, but the 2014 has no new oak. Uh, the 2015, because it came in with more tan from the skins, I balanced that up with, with tannin from uh, about 20%, 25% new French oak. You got it. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah, I'm going to mute you and then mute you to see if we can change the voice. Do everybody has uh, the same voice, a little situation here, technical, hold on. I'm going to mute you and I'm going to ask you to unmute again. Can you hear me now? Uh, the volume, uh, the, 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 the sound sounds like a little bit creaky, but we can see out here what you're saying. It's just a little bit bizarre. That's it. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, yeah, tan, uh, whole cluster before fermentation and barrel regimen after fermentation. Okay, what we're going to do, Andy, I'm sorry. Why don't you just unplug and re-sign again? And in the meantime, I'm going to ask people to uh, give me a little description of your wine. So unsign and sign again, it, it, may, it may help. You, can you do that? Okay, let's do that. Everyone, uh, sorry, a little technical, I need to go through that. Um, is anyone that want to take the lead on the 2014 Docker Hills? Um, obviously, we see the difference, and I just want to share that with you. So who's up to the task? Who's ready? Who's ready? Maybe... Maybe Luis, uh, no? Luis is a master sommelier, so he's ah, a little bit here. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> see, Alan put you under the train. <laughs> Go ahead, Luis, uh, Luis, say something. if you want to unmute, I'm asking you to, there we go, you're right here. No, so uh, I actually gave a, a quick synopsis of what I thought about the wines. Uh, I love this story, first of all. I think it's just, uh, especially in time like this and how we get encouraged back to uh, being connected even away, right? I mean, uh, and really what joins us apart is this fermented grape juice. I love it. Uh, yeah. But to me, Docker is special. I think that we, I have the 15th, so I don't know who has the 14th. I think that's best that somebody describe the 14th. Uh, but personally, go, with the, go with the 15 and we'll ask somebody else for the 14th. Yeah, I think, um, I'm sorry, somebody was describing it with, with, with those beautiful um, notes. But to me, it's more structured. It's a little bit tight right now. I think it's still a baby, but I think we can all appreciate it. For those of you who do component tastings, I think it's a, uh, uh, the structure is there, which is more important. The tannins are, are, are a bit um, uh, rounding a little bit, but I think it has a little bit of life there. I think in the next couple of years, this thing is going to be delicious. Um, but open it up. I think an hour or so, uh, you'll enjoy this with your favorite dish. Uh, but uh, uh, I love it. The length, the structure, it's really what I look for wines. Um, it's not always the one that you actually can drink right now, right? You have to enjoy it uh, later on. So that's my definitive on that docker. So. Uh, once we get more day you're back in track, we will definitely uh, be enjoying your Docker wines there. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. I really appreciate it. So happy to see you today. Um, who has the 14? I want to go and, and take the task and, and tell me a little bit what they think about the 14. 14, 14, 14. Um, I do have it in my glass, so I'm going to go over and... Um, it is definitely creamy. I'm always looking for texture in wine. So I do have all the descriptive about what you just mentioned, Luis, but I have more of the creaminess, I believe. Uh, the wine did have another year to, uh, to age, so the integration is well done. I believe the wood integration is very important as well, especially for Pinot. It can be very sensitive. Um, I really like uh, the, I will call that the coulis de framboise. I will call that the, the raspberry coulis. Uh, we have a beautiful, beautiful spice as well. I do have a little uh, smokiness to it. So I believe that's about the terroir. The influence is a little bit saline as well. It's also, I believe it's the influence of the uh, ocean and we don't have too far away. Uh, how far are we from the ocean at the uh, Docker Hills? It's about, it's about six and a half miles. Okay, um, so very and, close. Yeah, very close. And, and the soils there, are, it's an old um, marine marine layer. And so it's, it's um, harder sandstone with a um, 
uh, a shale layer on top pushed up by the folding from the Pacific plate uh, with fractured sandstone with the marine marine um, remnants on top. So you definitely get that 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 salinity from the soil. Good. Uh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what is your total production with every different grapes? I know you you kind of uh, uh, an artist over there. You're trying to uh, get your hand on all different stuff. And I know you have your wife next to you try to hold you like she does with like my wife does to me and say don't buy too much wine and, and, and you are like i don't want i don't want to hold myself to uh, to make a lot of wine so how many tolls at the end there how many different uh, how many cases we're making a year about two thousand cases a year two thousand um, cases how many different uh label uh we so we have uh it it varies because sometimes we blend, sometimes we uh, sometimes yeah. the pinots get blended up. But it's about it's about fourteen. Fourteen uh, different label. Yeah. So you you're just a micro uh, brewer. You you're a micro vinificator. You like to do a small batch, and you like to enjoy yourself making the best of the best. That's what it is. Uh, absolutely, yeah. That's the way it should be. Keep doing what you're doing. I don't mind about the small production. Mention my name. I heard a little buzzing over in the corner here, so I thought maybe it was my turn. Yeah. Just real quickly, I wanted to let you know. Um, I, I apologize. I got so excited to cut you off in the middle of our conversation. You asked about how we age the wines, and um, you know, if you were to go into our cellar right now and pull out uh, anything that wasn't the proper age, Andy would call it infanticide. And so, a lot of what it is that we're we're doing with our label is showing how you can have a 2014 dry Riesling really stand in 2020 as this amazing, um, you know, so that's part of also why we have so many varieties with so many vintages. It is a bit of a uh, exploration um, in how to age the wines. And even today, we're going to um, blend up some of our 2014 and 2015s that are still sitting in barrel, barrel aging. And so it is a craft. It is something that, you know, obviously we have to sell them. And now that you're here to take some of that load off of me, I'm stoked to go back to just being the artist with him. So tag you're it. And That's right. uh, tuned. I'll, I'll keep posting videos of, of how we're creating the artwork. Barefoot in the tank. That's your first mission. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, it, it's just great. Uh, I, I think we get a sense about what you're trying to establish. I, I think we all get a sense about uh, how natural you want to be in vinification. And I think everybody get a sense with those two wines, uh, with the philosophy that you're trying to bring over to this uh, great label called Bee Hunter. Um, is anybody has any question? I didn't hear too much about Jason. Jason, most of the time, I like to do the, <laughs> you point someone in your glass, so sorry to cut you on that. Do you have, <laughs> do you have any uh, comments or feedback or something that you want to add to that, Jason? I'm going to try to unmute you right here. Here we go. Um, I, first of all, sorry I was late to the party here. Um, You're here. As, as far as the wines, yeah, I, I mean, one of the things is we, we, in my restaurant, we have very, a very limited amount of Anderson Valley wines uh, and Mendocino wines on the list, and and I feel like it's because I'm always searching for something with quality and character and, and something that's a little bit more than just the, the, the typical, um, you know, Pinot from there. Uh, I definitely feel like these wines have, uh, being a steakhouse, I'm from Prime Steakhouse as well, have uh, a structure and tannin component to it that, that definitely fits with what we do there, um, especially the Docker Hill, uh, like Luis was saying, um, drinking good out of the glass, but I think in, in like I think he said, a half hour, hour, um, really going to start to show some of the other components in the wine, and it's tremendous, really, really good. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. Thank you for your feedback. Aaron, you want to add anything, or your dog want to take over? I love your dog. What is the name of your dog, buddy? His name's Cairo. He actually uh, looks like he loves it. Yeah, that's a, good, that's a good training. That's a good training. He's a puppy, eh? He's just... Just a very puppy. How old is he? Eight weeks. Oh, wow. Great. Congratulations. Brand new puppy. Um, what did you think about the wine in general and about the, the program here? Uh, I like the Docker Hill a lot. Uh, I enjoy kind of like the more fruit forward that I get from it and also kind of the more like tea-like tannins and structure that I get from it uh, versus the Anderson Valley. Uh, 
just in comparing the two in my mind right now, I, I do enjoy that kind of more rounded tea like and kind of a little bit more herbaceous for me too. So uh, yeah, that's what I like about the Dr. Hill. Great. And what about on your dish, on your menu? Uh, can you just give us a hint about wine pairing here? Uh, just uh, pick one. All day. I mean, anytime I drink a Pinot Noir, especially anything with some fruit like this in the high acidity, uh, I'm always running for the Duck Penang for sure. Nice. Mm. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Mindy, do you want to add anything? I'm going to unmute you. I'm asking you to unmute. Just click on the button. There we go. Hello, Thank Mindy. You. Hello. Hello. Thank you to be here. Thank you very much. I love the uh, a lot of tension in the 15 Docker, Docker Hill. Um, I think the ageability will be very nice. Uh, ironically, this would be great at my Italian restaurant. And I also don't have a lot of Anderson Valley. So, uh, so there we go. All right. Thank you. Thank you to be here. Really appreciate it. Is anybody want to add anything? Pascal, you good? It looks like you sweating your wine in your glass right here. So do you enjoy it? It's good. Do you want to mute? Did you enjoy it, Pascal? Just show me this and we're good. Uh, yeah, you're right here. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Guys, um, if anybody want to bring anything to the table, I want to keep it to an hour. So I have three minutes to announce the special deals. Um, I want to thanks again, Andre de Vignon. I want to thanks very, very much, Adi, to be part of it. Please keep uh, Andre staying and keep doing good wine. And your dog, of course. And this is her wine. There we go. J -J That's what we're blending today. Oh, that's cool. Thank Jay you. Jay Thank Jay. you to be part of Thank it. Thank you, guys. Bruno. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Andre. Keep doing what you're doing, buddy. Keep, uh, yes. keep uh, making some great wine for us. I am going to uh, top the recording, and that's where I usually announce those prices. So I don't want that to be against me. So I want to be sure then it's not part of the uh, recording session, but you can take my word for it. Those prices will be available to you because you're part of it. Uh, every other week, we're going to do that. Our next meeting is going to be with a Bordeaux producer. We're going to be in the, in the Chateau, in Bordeaux, in the right bank, uh, Chateau Picoron. Uh, that's where I'm from, uh, Saint Colomb, uh, right bank. And Stefan is a friend of my dad's and making a wine called Petit Picoron, Picoron for us. So in two weeks, stay tuned. It's going to be, um, uh, I believe, July 31st. And I'm going to try to make it at 10 o'clock or 10.30. Uh, I don't know if it's too early. I just want to be sure everybody has the time to run their business as we're starting to reopen. And hopefully we are reopening more and more faster. Um, so here we go. So the